Today, I am speaking with author Randy Braun about her Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The New Playbook for Women at Work. But this book isn't just about work. It's really a new playbook for women's lives, us midlife women's lives. And I can't wait to get started to talking about it. So let's jump in. Welcome, Randy, to the new mid. Michelle, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Well, I'm glad that Elizabeth Sandler introduced us, who is, I'm a huge fan of hers and think she's just an incredible Thanks. human being. Absolutely. She is the best. Hi, Elizabeth, if you're watching, we love you. Fangirling so hard for you over here. <laughs> Absolutely. And she, uh, when I asked her about, oh, I'd love to interview some, some women, especially about the workforce and life. And she's like, oh, you have got to meet my friend, Randy. She has this new book coming out. And at the time we connected, your book was just about to launch. And so congratulations, Randy, on hitting the bestsellers list for the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much. It was the wildest thing. And I'm so grateful that this book resonates with so many women. Um, as my dear friend, Neka Chiaizor, who I interviewed for this book, she's a senior executive at Cox Communication, always says when I shared this news with her, I actually beat out Prince Harry that week on, in the, on Kindle ebook. And Neka said, she's like, Randy, forget all the other accomplishments you've ever had for the end of your life. Your headline is I beat Prince Harry on the bestseller list for a week. So Neka, if you're listening to this, I'm giving you all the credit for that line. <laughs> That's fantastic. That is a great accomplishment. Well, what's so great about this book, <laughs> and I have to ask you, I can you hold up a copy if if you haven't seen yeah. it? But what I love about it is you have the X's and O's, you know, really like a playbook. Did you play sports when you were younger? You know, I did not play sports, um, but I grew up in a house of sports fanatics. I'm pretty sure that my father was one of the original legacy subscribers of NFL Sunday Ticket. Um, I grew up in a house where my mom really encouraged us that all activities my brother and I did were gender neutral. So I wasn't particularly good at sports. I broke multiple bones trying my hand at gymnastics or basketball, once even in a balloon pop relay, which is a story I'll tell you on another podcast, but I was dominant um, at Super Nintendo and Super Nintendo Madden and NBA Jam. So if anyone else played those games with me um, in the 90s, um, you will appreciate that. But also, Michelle, I have to tell you something funny. I was interviewed about this book on Talk Radio Europe, which is broadcast on the BBC. And you know, Michelle, I'm sure you'll ask me one final question at the end of today's podcast. You never know what that final question is going to be. The host goes, Randy, help me understand, what, what are the X's and O's on your cover? And I was like, oh my God, this is so funny because all the Americans get it right away. Um, and it was so funny to explain, you know, you get 30 seconds at the end of the interview to explain like, this is a play on a football play. So I love that you love it, Michelle. Well, they must have thought, are you, do you just have a bunch of hugs and kisses? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hugs and kisses. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, that's offense and defense. And so that's fun. Yes, I grew up in a household of brothers and I actually coached my daughter's third and fourth grade basketball team. So I am familiar with the X's and O's and doing plays, which love is it. fun. Okay, I love this book for many reasons, but it really isn't just about working women. It is, it's for that but you have so many life lessons and are so wise that I, I, I think this is a great book for every female to read. And what I want to say to you personally, I want to thank you for writing it because you say in your introduction that you're writing this for your two-year-old daughter. And I feel like I'm doing my work for my 11-year-old and 14-year-old daughters because we, we are the lead bearers for the next generation. And we're a little bit, I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> so my experience in the corporate world, I, I did use the old playbook for a lot longer than, than fortunately than you had to. The glass ceiling was broken for me, but 
I was of the generation being in the generation, the Gen X right now, where the female bosses above me were kind of like, I had to go through this. So you do too. Like hazing. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was. Like it hazing. Was- That's how I've always thought of that. Yes. And, and I'm right behind you. I'm an elder millennial. Um, and so there are things that I relate to across the span of Gen X and millennials. Um, For what it's worth, maybe a conversation for another day. I also think that Gen Z holds a lot of promise and we give them a bad rap, but back to you. Oh my gosh. I'm a huge Gen Z fan, by the way. And yes, we can talk about that (laughs) more, but I have so much hope for Gen Z more than my Gen X generation, by the way. But you talk about perfectionism. You talk about the internal dialogue. You talk about, you know, self doubt and so many listening to your intuition. I almost don't even know where to start. But one of the things I loved and laughed and felt was so compelling was your um, client who worked at Taco Bell, Michelle, right? I mean, not yeah. only is her name Michelle, <laughs> But here she is. She went to Harvard, I, I believe. And Wellesley. So Wellesley. Close. Sorry, sorry. She went to Wellesley, got laid off from her job, so had to find work. So she got hired at Taco Bell one summer. And being the fe- perfectionist she was, low person on the totem pole, she cleaned the bathroom at the end of the, of the night so incredibly clean. It's sparkled. And because of that, they kept her in that position. Absolutely. And I love this story. And I love that Michelle let me tell this story. So today, Michelle is a partner in a law firm. She is so successful. But like, like you tell the story, she was putting herself through school at Wellesley, that degree wasn't going to pay for itself. And she was so excited about her big city internship until like just within a matter of days of starting the company, you know, had some financial issues, I believe was the situation. And she was out of an internship and where she used to be sitting at some desk somewhere between marketing and legal. She was now coming into a Taco Bell in Parsippany in New Jersey between a Roy Rogers and a car wash. So it was very different, but Michelle like so many of us, such a self-described overachiever, such a self-described perfectionist. And she says, she said, no one was going to make that Taco Bell bathroom sparkle the way I was going to. And what happened was she did such an amazing job that the manager comes to her and he's like, no one's ever made the bathroom sparkle that way. So you know what she does, Michelle, she doubles down. The bathroom, every night, listening on her Walkman to Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, you know, she keeps cleaning her heart out. And so, of course, the next time a new hire comes a few weeks after, she just assumes, Michelle, hey, I'm going to get to go back to the burrito bar full time instead of being the closing bathroom cleaner at Taco Bell. Not a fun job. And management kept her in that position. You know, while this other newbie was filling Diet Cokes and manning the drive through window. And Michelle says, I, I tell the story in the book. I actually just, I think it came out on Friday, just told this story in a new Forbes article that's out about perfectionism. But the, the moral of the story is Michelle tells you, she says, I wish that this was the last time in my career I got stuck cleaning the bathroom. Because what happens sometimes as women is we're so attached to this idea that we must be perfect, that we hold ourselves back. And Michelle, I'm not letting our workplaces off the hook. I'm not letting our culture off the hook. We have so many systemic issues as women in the workplace we need to confront. And we also internalize these messages about what our value is. And we get ourselves stuck doing the office housework. I mean, in Michelle's case, it was literal. And she's the first person to tell you. Over the course of her career, she's had to constantly check herself on, am I cleaning the bathroom here when I should be making burritos? And that's important because I've seen in my own corporate journey, people have end up staying where they're at because they're so good at that and the bosses don't want to have them move on. So I think we all need to think, am I cleaning the bathroom or am I going to be able to go to the burrito, (laughs) make the burritos? But it's also important you bring up about this culture confidence, this confidence culture and how it's been given us, us women have been given the responsibility to find our own confidence, which I believe everything is an inside job. We have to start with ourselves. 
But we also have to look at the culture, at the perfectionism culture, at the confidence culture to make sure that we're keeping check with ourselves, but also with the culture that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. And this idea of confidence culture comes from two incredible scholars at Duke University um, who basically started to notice a trend. They started something in their office, I believe it was in 2013 or around 2015, called the confidence basket. And every single time they saw something in a magazine um, or, you know, in a poster around campus at Duke, they would tear it down and put it in the confidence basket. Um, and soon the basket started to overflow. And what was the issue, right? Because they were collecting these confidence notes. Well, the issue that they discussed and then studied rigorously from an academic perspective was that women were being told to what to worship at what they call the cult of confidence, where we can just yes girl ourselves and you've got this and power pose our way to confidence. And in falling prey to worshiping at that, making confidence this idol that we worship at, um, it was kind of the internalization of that imposter syndrome where we make it about us when really it's the rest of the world. And I tell everyone, I think this applies to every single woman, and I talk about this in my introduction about recognizing that every woman who's coming to the new playbook has her own goals, priorities, lived experience, origin story. We all feel the systemic inequity to varying degrees. And what we've been sold in this confidence culture what we've been sold in telling, being told that we have imposter syndrome is that the problem is us. The problem is actually not us. It's a lot of the issues that we face just trying to go around, um, you know, our, our days. And, you know, I am a cisgender white woman. I experience the world in a way that other women who are going to pick up this book don't. But yet I hope every single woman who picks up this book is able to really see herself in it because writing the new playbook, Michelle, it's not about my new roles. It's about helping you and everyone else who listens to this podcast and everyone else who picks up the book design their own without letting our culture off the hook. And the last thing I'll say here, Michelle, is I do write about my daughter in the introduction to this book because this book is meant to be a snapshot in a moment of time. My greatest wish is that our culture and our workplaces will have caught up to a place where the lessons in this book are patently irrelevant for my daughter and your daughter because there are less inequities in our workplace. But in I don't know about you, Michelle, I have goals and hopes and dreams that cannot wait another decade. And so I'm hoping that the new playbook will equip women with the tools to thrive now instead of just survive in a workplace culture that's not designed for our success. Well, I'm looking forward to, in a few years from now, having the new addition to this because you're <laughs> having to rewrite some of it. <laughs> Something that was wonderful, many things obviously were wonderful in this book, but you talk about fear. And one of the things that I, I went, huh, wait a minute, because I do believe in having courage and, you know, being the core from our hearts is really what courage is all about and kind of what the meaning started from. But you talk about fear in accepting it. Yeah. You know, I think one of the most important things that we can do is learn to be with fear instead of in fear. And, you know, Michelle, when I think about my own experience growing up, or I'm sure you can relate to this, I feel like anyone else who is in midlife can relate to this. We were told when we were girls, we were part of that generation that could do anything. The sky's the limit. You could do everything. And that bullish vision was inspiring in some ways. It was problematic in a little others. And one of my biggest gripes is that it left no room for self-doubt and fear to be a healthy part of the equation. And what I learned, you know, and I'm sure that you may be able to relate to this and other women in midlife, was that if I felt fear, the issue was me. I wasn't being strong enough. I wasn't being bold enough. And the standard was that I needed to be fearless. Being fearless is an impossible standard. And when we fail to meet it, we spiral into this shame and self-doubt. And what I try and hold myself to the standard of, and it's something that you know what I write about in the book, is not to be brave or be fearless, but to be courageous. And the word courageous comes from the Latin root core, which means heart. And for a long time, courage and being courageous simply meant to act from one's heart. And so I can tell you, I have fear all the time. And if anyone who's listening to this podcast thinks that just because I wrote 
wrote a book and I'm on a podcast, I'm fearless, I have failed you. Um, I am a recovering, as I write about extensively in the book, I'm a recovering risk avoider. My natural state is one of a little bit of anxiety. And I've learned to be with fear, not in fear. And if there's one piece of advice I can give, it's in the face of fear, to be courageous, to act from your heart, to fall back on your core values. You know, as I quote my friend and colleague Marissa Fernandez in this book, I've never bet on myself and lost. Um, and that's how I've come to think about fear. And I'm so glad to hear that it resonated with you. Because like you were saying earlier, we grew up with the commercials of, I bring home the bacon, I fry it up in a pan and never let my, my husband or my man forget he's a man or something with that, you know, it, th- those are kind of impossible things to live up to. And you can Oh my God, and the heteronormativity that. alone, the heteronormativity <laughs> alone blows my mind. Absolutely. But one of the things you said in there and you talk about in the book are making wise decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we underestimate how many times a day we are truly at choice, truly at choice. Um, So, you know, one of the things that I think when it comes to our decision making that too many brilliant, successful midlife women get wrong is that we have gotten it wrong with how we think about productivity. Um, So, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is I think that a lot of us hide out in our productivity and we make bad choices and bad calculations in our time. I think we hide out in our productivity when we're overwhelmed by how stressed we are. And so we just burrow further and further and further into that. Um, And that's supported by research from Dr. Ashley Willens at Harvard Business School, who wrote an incredible book that I'll pull right here from my own shelf called Time Smart, which your listeners should read next. I think that we burrow into productivity when we're feeling perfectionistic and scared of what other people are going to think of us. And it's easier to dive into a to-do list and be vulnerable. And I think that we burrow into productivity and hide out there when we actually have no clue what it is that we want in our life. And suddenly getting to inbox zero, it might stink, but it's a lot easier than asking tough questions. And One of the frameworks that I talk about, it's kind of a thread that carries through each chapter, is about drilling down to the smallest places in your life you can choose to say yes and choose to say no. And when we start to take control of those small decisions, I find they make a macro impact. Like you just have to look at your bank account or your 401k to see the power of compound interest. And I think that we forget that our decisions render compound interest in our life as well. And right now we have so many decisions to make. I mean, we always have a lot of decisions to make, but oh yeah, we are had, going through <laughs> a lot of different changes. And so this is challenging how we make decisions and what we choose. And those choices have, you know, consequences, good and bad. And so I know when you were starting your business, Um, you had to, you had to make the choice to leave your corporate job, to sort of take this leap of faith, believe in yourself and move forward. And, you know, here you are the wall street journal bestseller who beat out Harry Prince Harry's book, which congratulations (laughs) again. Um, (laughs) so in making those decisions and making that choice, There are a lot of women right now who are my clients. I have some who are in corporate and they're going for promotions. Some are getting it, which is exciting. I have others who are thinking, wait, maybe I'm going to take the leap of faith and I'm going to leave corporate and start something new. What tools would you suggest for them to use in making these type of choices, these decisions? Yeah, well, I'll share the tools in a moment. You just hit on something which is a trend that I'm watching and one I've been quite a while. The research shows us that women and working mothers in particular are the fastest demographic of entrepreneurs. And so I am bullish about that. I'm also cautious because I know that women make, you know, depending on the study you look at, 80 to 82 cents on the dollar as compared to men, women entrepreneurs make 78 cents on the dollar as compared to our male counterparts. So I'm excited and I'm bullish about women entrepreneurs taking the reins. And I want to encourage any woman who's thinking about making that leap to price what you are worth. Let's close that gap. Um, But back to your question about the frameworks, right? So one of the chapters that I have in this book is all about goal setting. And, um, you know, 
a few things that I just want a lightning round here. Number one, I'm a huge believer that our goal should be a contact sport. And what I mean by that is like, I'm not asking you to tackle the people in your network, but I'm asking you to ask them to help you tackle your goals. So when you're tempted to do research, make lists, um, go on a deep dive rabbit hole down the internet, find the people in your network who can champion your goal, share information, make the connections. Everything I can tell you that I've built in my company, every story that is in this book is because I put my ideas out there in contact with somebody else. That's not magic about me. That's just working the process of making your goals a contact sport. And the other thing, Michelle, that I'll offer is about making your goals as small as possible as you build up. Um, I don't want to run away with the question, but can I tell a story to Absolutely. help illuminate this? Yes, please. Perfect. So one of the stories I'm absolutely positively obsessed with is that of the great British Olympic cycling team. And you might have heard this story. Um, Malcolm Gladwell made it famous in Outliers. You know, in the early 2000s, they got one gold in the 2000 games, two gold in the 04 games. And in the 2000, early 2000s, they also scooped up a new coach, a man by the name of Sir David Brailsford, who actually was not even a professional cyclist. He was a businessman, but a cycling enthusiast. And he had a theory of the case. He wanted to borrow the business concept of Kaizen, which is continuous micro iteration and improvement, and bring it to the way the team tra trained. So instead of Michelle, instead of trying to find one place where the team could make this outstanding 100% performance leap, he looked at 100 places where they could make teeny tiny 1% tweaks, their helmets, their diets. He found the best pillows and mattresses, and he took them with them everywhere they traveled around the globe. And 1% here, 1% there, they went from uh, two golds in 04, quadrupling to eight golds in 08. So sometimes I tell people this story and they're like, okay, but I'm not an Olympian. And I'm like, but you are, and your sport is life. And um, in the pandemic, I was running a group that I run from time to time. Um, and we were doing a session on goals. I had a woman in my group who was a mom to three kids in three different teleschools. This was shortly after the murder of George Floyd. She worked in social justice and she had never, ever been more stretched than in her life. Um, I said to her, what is it that you really want? If I could give you more time in your day, she said, I really want to run more. And so we drilled down, Michelle, on a, a tiny goal she was going to say yes to and a tiny goal she was going to say no to for the next day. She was going to set her alarm clock just a few minutes earlier. I think it was 10 or 15 minutes to run. That was her yes commitment. And her saying no commitment to protect the yes, because Michelle, as a coach, you know, if our clients could just say yes and do something, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be coming to us with the problem. They need our help sometimes architecting the no to protect the yes. So she said, I'm going to say no to hitting the snooze button and my partner, they're going to push me out of bed to make sure it happens. She goes, Michelle, she gets her run in 10 or 15 minutes. Between you and me, I don't think about it again. We talk, we debrief, but the, the session moves on, right? Well, holiday time comes. So we're talking about like six months and she sends me a thank you note for a bottle of champagne that I sent. And with one day of saying yes and saying no, that became two days, that became three days, that became four days. She went from a 10, 15 minute run to running her first marathon in a six month period. And this is a real woman. She lives in Buffalo. <laughs> I tell people, if this woman can do this, like you're an Olympian too. So I hope that the women who are listening to this will feel empowered to choose one thing to say yes to and one thing they're going to have to say no to protect, to protect that yes, to carve out their own micro moments. And let me and Michelle know, like, how are you quadrupling your goals? I love that so much because it is, it's powerful and it's simple and it's absolutely easy. We can do that. And that does actually come with discipline too, which if you're playing a sport, you have to have discipline. <laughs> Um, there are so many other things I wanted to talk to you about this book. You talk about uh, when we choose to blow up the plan. You talk about mm -hmm. keeping boundaries. There is uh, dealing with negative feedback. Um, is there anything, because there is one other question I want to ask you, but is there anything that you want to, regarding the book, leave us with or, you know, just a taste of something so that um, we'll be running to, to Amazon or our local bookstore to grab it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so here's what I will tell you. Um, I talk about in that well-being chapter, which is the final chapter in the book about these five self-care myths. And we don't have time to get into all of them right now that hold women back and keep us just entrapped in our own exhaustion. 
And no matter which one of those myths you see yourself in, and I encourage you to pick up the book and kind of see for yourself, um, I hear the overwhelming response again and again to talking about self-care from women. And it's this, it's, you know, I feel guilty about taking the time for myself. And I like to remind women, especially those of us at midlife, those of us who are in the sandwich generation or are caregiving or just at like the apex of making some of the decisions that are gonna change the course of our life. This We experience guilt when we violate our own personal code of conduct or our values. Rarely does doing self-care violate your code of conduct or your values. So the next time you feel guilt, and for those of you who are just listening on audio, I'm using very exaggerated air quotes with my fingers. The next time you feel guilt, I want you to check yourself. Do I feel guilt or do I feel fear? Do I fear, fear, feel a fear that people are gonna judge me? Do I feel a fear that people aren't gonna understand or are gonna feel disappointed by my choices? And that's really you being tethered to a form of external validation, which by the way, also gets its own chapter in this book. And so regardless of, I hope you'll pick up the book, but if you don't, I want you to leave with this one thing. The next time you feel guilt, check yourself. Wait, am I feeling guilt or am I feeling a fear of what other people are going to think about me? Which is so powerful to think of it that way. My last question is if hey. I could wave a magic wand and get rid of one negative thing in the world, what would you want that to be? Uh, systemic racism. Mm. Yes. I, you know, it's interesting because I almost don't think people realize that there, there's racism everywhere and they might not even think of how they're thinking or what they're saying is racist. And I think having more awareness for that could be really impactful. Yeah. And for those of you who are listening or watching and are curious about that, um, I really like the book White Fragility, um, I think is a great book for thinking about how um, if you are a white person um, like I am, how, you know, you can kind of think about how you can be more actively anti-racist or check your implicit bias. So that would be my magic wand. Um, I really do believe that getting rid of systemic racism would do a lot to close the wage gap, which by the way, has increased the length of an entire generation in the last three years. Um, you know, I really believe that the wage gap is just such an important metric for seeing how women's contributions are valued. And the more you dig into the nuance of the data, the more you really start to unearth why. So short answer, systemic racism. Long answer, I wish we had another half an hour, Michelle, to go deep on all the things I just mentioned. Well, thank you so much, Randy, for being here. And how can people get in contact with you? A few simple ways. Number one, please find me on social media. I am Randy with an I, Braun like the electric toothbrush or coffee maker. No, I'm not the heiress to the fortune on LinkedIn, Randy Braun. And I am something major coaching on both Instagram and TikTok. Finally, you can find me on my website, somethingmajorcoaching.com, which has tons of events, programs, articles, and you can find my book, Something Major, the new playbook for women at work on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble. Here's the trick even being a Wall Street Journal bestselling first-time author, Michelle. It takes time to get into independent booksellers. So if you have a local bookstore you absolutely love, call them and ask them to order a copy of this book for for you and for the others in your community. Um, Michelle, we have a whole nother podcast about first time women authors breaking into all different parts of the publishing world, bestseller or not. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for being here, Randy. And please, everyone go out and grab this book. It's absolutely fantastic. It has so many gems in there and it's, it's just a really well, well worthwhile read. So thank you, Randy. Thanks, Michelle.